Okay, this is the January meeting of the WebRTC Working Group, the first meeting of 2024. You should all know this, but just a reminder that we operate under the W3C IPR policy in only people and companies that are listed as contributors are allowed to make substantive contributions. So welcome to the meeting. Um, we're going to operate a little differently at this meeting than we have in the past. We're going to talk about uh, the status of documents and then uh, try to make some progress on some of the blocking issues. And then we'll talk about new work in whatever to see extensions. We have future meetings scheduled for February 20th, March 26th, and April 23rd. So the slides, as usual, are published on the wiki. A link to them is there. Um, do we have a scribe for the meeting? Uh, anyone volunteers for scribe? Shouldn't be too complicated. You'd, all you have to do is just put down things that we that got decided. Anybody willing to volunteer? I can, I can do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Henrik. Okay, and just a reminder, we're being recorded, and the recording will be made public. All right. W3C Code of Conduct, we operate under one, and let's try to keep conversations cordial and professional. And I think you all know this, but we do run a speaker queue. You raise your hand to get into it and lower your hand to get out of it. Um, please don't jump the queue or we'll mute you. And uh, just a little bit about document status, just because something's in a repo doesn't imply adoption by the working group. Um, and we sometimes put notes and specs to indicate uh, issues which do not have consensus. Um, we'll be talking about other measures of document status uh, today. All right, so we're gonna spend 20 minutes just talking about document status for the things we're specifically talking about today. And then we're going to talk about, for about an hour, issues blocking spec advancement on, on these particular specs. Um, and then we'll talk about some new work. I think uh, that's mostly from Florent. Um, uh, and then we'll wrap it up. All right. So uh, for status, what I thought I would do is concentrate on the things we're talking about today. Uh, which is Weber to CPC, Media Capture Main, uh, Content Hints, Weber to CSVC, Encoded Transfer, and Media Capture Transfer. Now, the working group has an enormous number of specifications. We just decided for this particular meeting we would try to make progress on these six. So that's what I'll talk about today. Um, there's a variety of ways that we could look at the status of specs. Um, there's the formal uh, spec status within W3C. There's a level of implementation, there's a test status in WPT, and there's a level of issues. Um, I'll try to uh, give you a smattering of each of these. We can talk about what the best measures would be. But the overall goal of this is to understand uh, where we are on a particular spec. Uh, and if, if the spec seems unusual in some way, that is, uh, in particular, if a spec has been very widely implemented, but it's not at the standard status you would expect for something that, uh, with that history, that's that's kind of a warning flag. Um, and we'll talk about at least one spec that's in that category. Also, if specs um, aren't getting issues handled in a timely way, that's a flag. On the other hand, some specs have very few issues left, but they're still not advancing, and um, that that's worth talking about. So. Um, I'll try not to snow you with too many graphs. There's there's quite a few graphs and things like that in here. But I'd like to encourage a discussion of what's going on with these specs and what we could do um, to advance them a little bit more quickly. So to start out, I mean, there's the one thing, probably most important thing this working group has been doing is WebRTC PC. Um, and we have been recycling uh, WebRTC PC ad recommendation. But the last time we did this was March uh, 2023, and we've been doing it. Um, uh, so it's it's been a while. Uh, going to be a year in March uh, since we've last done that. 
Um, so that's the question is what, what um, recycling frequency are we targeting? Um, you know, are we, are we targeting about every year or something different from that? I don't know if people have opinions, Harold, do you have an opinion about roughly how often we should be recycling this? Well, the, we have this mechanism of uh, integrating, uh, integrating extensions into the spec. Right. And, uh, as candidate recommendations and, uh, getting those uh, from candidate recommendation to actually being recommendation in status uh, requires uh, some work uh, my my guesstimate says that uh, if we leave this uh, if, if we don't uh, don't uh, do an upgrade round uh, at least once a year we'll forget about it but i don't see any big purposes in doing it faster than that okay so maybe a goal of a year uh, not not faster than that, uh, but um, yeah, trying to keep it roughly that cadence. Okay, um, and then you know uh, I think we've we've talked about this uh, for a long amount of time. It's implemented in all browsers, uh, so we'd expect it to be at rec status. Um, just one little warning sign there: fifty open issues with twenty open more than a year. Um, so that uh, isn't really in keeping with a goal of trying to. Uh, recycle this thing every year. We should have a lot. We should have less uh, bugs open uh, more than one year. And then, in terms of the commits, um, you can see here it's kind of an eye eye graph uh, that we peaked around the time that we recycle the recommendation. We've kind of fallen off since then. Um, so, what I would say is we're not probably in great shape for re for uh, recycling every year. And this might be something where we uh, try to put a little bit more attention on it. And that's one of the reasons why um, we're going to be talking about two open issues this year. Um, I won't bore you with the WPT status. Obviously, it's enormous, and there's a lot of, a lot of things uh, in there. OK, so let's talk about media capture and streams. Um, this one is a little bit unusual because it's, of course, very, very widely implemented, but has never gotten uh, to propose recommendation or recommendation. So that's kind of a flag uh, there, although it has been recycling at, at candidate recommendation. Um, and this one, of course, implemented in all browsers. Um, the issue stage is a little bit better than WebRTC CPC, 31 open issues, only nine of which have been open more than a year. And if you look at the commits, um, you know we have been we have been doing work uh, on it and spiking at various times, but let's just say since October of 2023, uh, the commit rate has been relatively low. Um, so overall, probably this doesn't have the commit rate that would lead you to believe that we're gonna we're on a road to uh, get to proposed recommendation or recommendation without a little bit of uh, bumping of the focus. Um, and so we're going to try to do that over the next couple of months uh, is, is, is focus on it a little bit more. And again, I, uh, and here's the WPT status of uh, media capture streams. Um, it, you know, I think generally, if you look at it, it's, it's pretty good. Um, I don't know if anybody has any observations on it. There are, it is kind of interesting that there are some tests that have no passes in the browser. Um, that seems like the kind of thing worth looking at to understand why that's the case. Uh, anybody have a comment? Uh, yes, so, so, so I can speak to uh, Firefox here. Uh, some of these tests uh, require infrastructure that okay. is missing in order to be green. So just because it's red doesn't mean it doesn't work. Okay, doesn't mean it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, are there things, Yanivar, that you think are not implemented enough to be in the spec? Is there stuff we're going to have to take out to get a recommendation, or is this just all of these instances are just uh, anomalies that don't really reflect on anything? Well, I think uh, we still haven't implemented uh, get capabilities. That would be nice to get in. Uh, okay. I think there was an issue on uh, a couple of things, like uh, some constraints, like uh, resize mode, and I forget the other two sample rates. Something okay, like that. that could be feature at risk. But overall, is your judgment that is there an issue with the test we need to improve in some way, or is it kind of fine as it is? I know Harold has an opinion as well. Uh, just a question right. for you, Yanivar. 
No, I think I think we're in good shape. Otherwise, yeah. Okay. The, the problem is with testing device infrastructure, which uh, we also have an right, automation right. spec that kind of languished a bit there. Right. Actually, that's an interesting point, uh, Harold. Yeah. So the big red bars here, are of course, uh, media stream track transfers. Right. And uh, and, and so, uh, hmm. yeah, Neva, is this, is this a problem in that this? It's hard to write the test, write test for it to, uh, in the current in the current state of affairs, or is, is there some feature that isn't implemented? Uh, on I know it's like frame transfer. Oh, is this about media stream track transfer? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think uh, yeah, that's a pretty new feature. So I think there's still interest, implementer interest in that. I don't know if. Uh, Unless Safari implements it, we don't implement it yet. You Um We are not yet implementing it. Uh, I have a prototype that is working for workers. Um, but it, it's an interesting point, this uh, particular item, because the spec is Media Capture Main, but the transfer is in Media Capture Extensions. Right. So maybe oh, okay. uh, maybe it should be flagged as, you know, maybe we should split it, like, or maybe it's a tentative. Well, it's more than tentative, but... Uh, Maybe we should better organize the test so that it's clear that they are extensions and not related to the main spec. Right, right. Actually, that's a good point. Yeah. So we can really so we be could, here. We yeah. can move those tests. Yeah. So, uh, Henrik, just a note that we probably should move these tests, which aren't part of media capture streams. They're part of extensions. Yeah, because that's a little misleading. Thanks for catching that. Yeah, and there's a both for audio and video. Okay, so that explains this. I was just wondering what was going on here. Okay. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about content hint. This is only at a working draft, um, uh, but the tests seem to show implementation on three browsers. Is that right, UN? That, that I, I guess Safari does implement content hints. Is that true? Um, yeah, we have some preliminary support. Uh, right. Right. Uh, but we, we, we have some bugs with the graduation preference that, that I know of. Um, right, right. Yeah. They're kind of related. But I guess my point is that this, it seems to me like the status of this, that it's only a working draft, is out of sync with the implementation, which is getting there. So this is probably something that ought to go, you know, we, we should push to advance. Um, and we'll talk more about it uh, later in this meeting, but there aren't a lot of issues with this. So it look, doesn't look like it'll be a huge... It's not a huge lift to get it to CR, um, and the you know since it's been implemented, um, why not? Uh, so that's that's one thing that sticks out here is we we could uh, content hint could go a little further than it has, uh, and then uh, actually we'll take a look. Okay, so next one is SVC. This is also a working draft um, at the moment, uh, but it. Uh, it has been implemented in Chromium. Um, I did see in media capabilities indication of support in Safari Tech Preview, but the WPT tests aren't passing. Um, there's only one open issue here, uh, which has been around for more than a year. We will talk about it. Um, so uh, I guess uh, UN, uh, so here's a WPT status, which shows that it's not implemented in Safari Tech Preview. But it, it does, uh, the media capabilities does advertise that some of the modes are there. Yuen, do you have a comment? Although uh, I tested it not on macOS, on macOS 14. So I don't know if that makes a difference. Um, yeah, I should look at this test. Uh, I don't, I haven't looked with her there. That's yeah, they don't. Uh, yeah. I, like I said, they look out of sync with what I'm seeing on macOS, the later, you know, Sonoma. Uh, so maybe there's a Sonoma dependency for some of this stuff. Uh, um, but uh, in any case, this is one where there's only really one open issue that's not an extension, and we'll talk about it. Uh, it's been around for more than a year, so we could at least address the open issue and uh, see what's going on with the implementation. Okay, so in Coded Transform, again, a working group, a draft, uh, but um, so let's let's talk about the test here. I guess it's kind of uh, odd in that uh, you have some passes 
uh, although not a great level of passing, you know, one out of every like 30, 40 percent for Firefox and Safari, and then very little on Edge and Chrome. Uh, so this is a little bit worrisome in terms of the test status uh, in that uh, it's so, not not great. I don't know if this is a problem with the tests or the problem with a spec or so there, there are two, two things there. The, the first one is that we are reorganized the test so that uh, the past incarnation, the uh, encoded uh, transform initial API is in the tentative subfolder. So you can see that Chrome is passing like uh, 20 right, right. of 27. And uh, the, the tests that are remaining in the top, uh, <clears throat> top folder are the tests that are following the spec. And you can see that uh, Firefox and Safari are implementing the script transform, and for the S-frame transform, it's not yet enabled anywhere. Oh, okay, okay. So that's, yeah, it's the S-frame transform. So, so, so we have the difference in terms of implementation, and we have a S-frame that is uh, not exposed anywhere, so maybe uh, if we want to uh, move forward, it would be a feature at risk. Uh, right, eventually. right. So I guess, yeah, that, but my question, I guess, uh, yeah, so as the S-frame transform would, uh, if you wanted to move forward, would need to be removed. It would be a feature of risk, right? Um, so that, that's a pretty big feature of risk, though. <laughs> a pretty big, big part of the spec. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, I would say that this is a spec problem. We don't have agreement yeah. on uh, a couple of uh, yeah. key features of the spec. So, uh, uh, so the tests in tentative reflect uh, Reflect the state of uh, of implementation before we come to agreement. Yeah. Yeah. So this one looks like it. For a bunch of the other ones, it looks like the specs are doing okay, the implementations are doing okay. Uh, it's just we've we've lagged behind in in advancing it. This one seems to have some legitimate legitimate issues uh, keeping it back. Um, but we probably we probably they won't go away if we don't talk about them. So we probably should should think about this. Okay, another one is media capture transform. Uh, this is also only a working group, group draft and uh, been that way since October 2022. So not much has been happening with this in terms of spec advancement. Um, my understanding is this is in Chromium as well as Safari test preview. Um, but there's 18 open issues. 17 have been open for more than a year. Um, and then the level of activity, you know, commits, whatever, has has fallen off pretty dramatically uh, uh, since 2022. Um, so I guess uh, my question is, is this one, I think it's being, is it, it being implemented in test preview? Is that right, Yuen? Um, it's it's a partial implementation, so it's not yet complete. It's not, an, not, yet, it's not yet enabled by default either. Yeah. And we, we might end up in the same situation as Encody Transform, where uh, Safari Tech Preview will implement what's in the spec, and Chrome will uh, is implementing the previous uh, version of the spec. So we, we might see the same yeah. kind of uh, test. Yeah, this is um, the, WP, the WPT yeah. test does show some of that now. Uh, but I'm just wondering also, like the other ones, are they testing the right version of Safari Preview with the right OS? Uh, I guess if it's not on my default, maybe that explains all the red stuff. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, but but it might be coming in, so we should keep a watch on it. So this one has the potential to at least have some uh, enough implementation across the board. Um, um, well, we need to resolve the fact that uh, there, there's a like it's, it's the same story as Encoded Transform. There might be a two API versions in two different browsers and uh, so right we, but but there's no yeah. but the functionality is more or less the same it's just a little bit of difference in the in the API but only for the video right uh, it, it's like encoded transform it's the yeah. same functionality but different API shape yeah right right uh, the, uh, the key issue is of course uh, availability on main on, on main thread right right that's the biggest one yeah and uh, and we have a problem with transferability in that uh, uh, insertable streams is completely useless without the ability to transfer 
Right. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, transferring media stream, media stream tracks, it's not implemented by any browser. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, that's an interesting point, Harold, because essentially what you're saying is that in some ways, the media uh, media stream transfer should be on this WPT because it's kind of related to it. You see what I'm saying? Um, we're sticking it in the extensions, but it, it actually kind of relates to the implementability of this of this spec in some ways. Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's a uh, little so bit. Gido, uh, Gido is yeah. on the queue. Yeah. Hi, Gido. Uh, Any thoughts? Yeah. Uh, yes, I want to mention the situation. Well, it's similar, but not, not quite the same as with encoded transform in the sense that the, um, the main disagreements we have is that uh, we're basically in uh, Chrome is proposing mostly a superset of, of what uh, the current spec says, which is basically a Availability on window and support for audio. Uh, yeah. And but uh, yes, uh, th th there's one small difference in API shape, uh, which is the video track uh, generator, which I think we can. Uh, it, it it's very similar to the mainstream track generator that that we had in the older version, and we can we can easily make uh, a version that is compatible uh, right. with the spec or relatively easily so so if we come to a further agreement that but but of course the the, the main thing blocking here is the the transferability of tracks the which, transferability model right which no one has implemented it yet right yeah uh, just to say we have a prototype and it will be available in separate tech preview uh, probably in the coming month okay Right, and you have in Safari Tech Preview the, uh, you know, if you wanted to play with this, for example, you have the Web Codex audio as well as the video now. Uh, Not so. video, J just video. Oh, okay. I saw the audio in, uh, oh, uh, I saw the audio decoder and encoder in Tech Preview. I guess it's not completely there. It's okay. not enabled by default, and it's not not enabled complete. by default. Right, right. Yeah, and not complete as well. Not complete. Okay. All right, so this is roughly a summary of, of the specs we're going to be talking about. Um, if I had to summarize kind of what we've just been talking about, um, it would be that there's some good news in that there are specs that are uh, widely implemented but who've lagged behind um, in the specs. So it's, it's kind of a question of bringing the specs up to the level of implementation uh, that we have. And there are quite a few of those. Um, and it doesn't seem like a huge task. It doesn't seem insurmountable. We just need a little bit more focus. And then there are other specs like encoded transform, uh, media capture transform, where there really is a spec issue. Um, and, and that's going to cause some issues with implementation. But there are real spec issues there. And so the implementation status probably reflects the, the status of the spec. Um, and uh, maybe we ought to be uh, focusing more. But overall, uh, you know, looking at this, uh, there's quite a few instances where um, there is a, a difference between uh, the level of advancement and, and where the spec really is in terms of its implementation. Um, so over the next couple of meetings, we're going to try to make some progress. And um, this meeting is, is the first of those. And so we're going to be getting into uh, blocking issues. What we mean by blocking issues is things that we think we can make progress on at this meeting. Um, that are uh, potentially blocking moving on uh, to the next step. Um, and so here's what we have on our agenda for the next hour or so. Uh, we've got uh, two issues in WebRTC CPC, um, uh, really uh, one issue in WebRTC SVC, but it requires a little bit more description. Uh, one in Media Capture Transform, one in Encoded Transform, uh, one in Media Capture Main, and two in uh, Content Hint. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to go through these and, and make some progress and get things uh, a little bit closer. All right, I think this is uh, Fepo. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Good. So set correct preferences is a somewhat tricky API. We have a description of it in JSEP, which says it does not affect the send codex. But WebRTC PC specifies it in a way that it looks at send and receive codecs. 
And we notice that way too late. And it changes the model a little bit. I've added a longer description of the issue to the uh, of the problem to the issue. And I have two proposals. One is we fix WebRTC CPC and align it with JSEP by removing the mentions of send codex in the algorithm as a PR preview, if you want. And we also need to fix the issue that we don't define how codecs match with each other. For example, this is a problem with codecs like H.264, which have profile level, level asymmetry allowed. And we do not describe how this matching happens and what happens with things like default right. attributes, default values in the FMTP line. So I have, don't have a fix for the second yet, but for the first one, I have a fix. Do we agree that we want to move forward with removing the send codex from the algorithm? Okay, thumbs up from Harald. Yeah. And Janivar. Okay, I will make CR for that and work on the codex match algorithm. So uh, just a question, Fippo. Um, when all this work gets done, uh, there's also tests that need to change, is that right? Yes, that will be, I will update the WPT as well. Okay. Um, and I'm just wondering, at the end of the day, one of the things that should work that maybe wouldn't work otherwise would be like a codec like HEVC? Yes. Or, or uh, there are also H.264 tests, I guess, you could do that don't work today, right? Uh, we have issues on Android with codecs that are only available for send or receive. And that okay. is how we noticed that issue in the first place. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, um, we'll, we'll get to it in a bit, uh, Fippo, but I think some of the same problems on the matching may occur in other APIs. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. Yes. Harold? Yeah, so I uh, just note that uh, I, I put up an issue, 2925, about uh, doing uh, more deep dives in uh, into redefining the codec model i would uh, very much like comment like more comments on that i i know that people have seen it already but uh, okay especially on neva and un which usually have we, we use usually have opinions right okay uh yeah that one it might actually be a good thing to put on the agenda for a future meeting just talk that through because uh, it's it's obviously pretty important to getting things uh, working. All right, thank you. Okay, now 29.15. I know, Yanivar, do you want to talk this through? Uh, in, you want to show the GitHub or something? Uh, yes, if you could uh, click on the issue there. Okay. For me. Sorry, I didn't have time to uh, to add the yeah. slide on this one. Okay, uh, we, we still we still see the we don't see the GitHub issue yet. Oh, okay. I have to share <laughs> this tab instead. Sorry. Right. Now, can you see it? Uh yes. <clears throat> okay, cool. So, so basically, the issue issue here is that um, we've been uh, uh, the media capture main this sort of. We've been discussing Butte a lot in various specs, and one of them is media capture main. <clears throat> and this is the and it's kind of crept up that it showed some doubt about what WebRTC PC was saying about mute. Um, and uh, basically, I think part of the problem here is that media capture main has two jobs. One is to define the streams and tracks model, <clears throat> and the other is to define get user media, which is explicitly for microphone and camera. And so in describing <coughs> things, it uh, so when it, it tries to describe and set up the concept that tracks can be muted, there's basically two pieces. One is the mechanics of how that works. And to describe that, in, in short, JavaScript can turn off uh, production of a track using the track enabled flag. And there's a separate uh, muted state that only the user agent can control that is outside the control of JavaScript. And so that is generally thought of as a property of the source. <clears throat> now the source uh, is can be different 
uh, all the so for get user media, the source is a camera or a microphone. But for WebRTC PT, the source is a remote track that is sourced by incoming data from a peer connection. <laughs> so um, the and as it's like it's supposed to have, the WebRTC has its own section about uh, media stream track. <coughs> And, and with, with its own definition of when things should be muted and unmuted. But there's some lack of clarity here whether the what the main media capture main says about muted also applies here. What media capture main says is that user agent can mute a track at any time for various reasons like a user closing uh, the laptop lid or, uh, when the you know that has an internal camera. And language that's more specific to camera and microphone. <clears throat> so does that apply here? And I think, so that's the first question for the working group. I think it doesn't, uh, I think the way I read the spec, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the the definition in WebRTC PC of when things, when the user agent should mute or unmute is the full description of it when things can be muted or unmuted. And that is supposed to replace media capture main. So the first question is to the group is that. Uh -huh. I think that there are situations where it's natural to mute that are not listed in uh, in Robert CPC at the moment. <coughs> For instance, when uh, the network is disconnected, and uh, or the, rather the state of uh, state of the pay connection goes goes to disconnected. It seems that. It would be reasonably logical for, to also mute the tracks. So uh, no, I don't think I don't think we have enumerated the cases, and I don't think we should claim to have enumerated the cases. Okay, you win. Um So we, I, I think, so the muted event is, is JavaScript observable, so we want interoperability there. So I think that if uh, we, we should get consensus on when and where should mute happen. Um, so I, I would vote for at least trying to get consensus on that, saying, hey, we should, all browsers should mute on the same kind of uh, uh, items, and we should list that in the list, in the, in the, in the spec. And currently, uh, the current proposal to say, hey, we, we mute there, that's, what uh, browsers are doing currently is is good, and we can extend it uh, later on as we discover more things like uh, network conditions or whatever. Yeah, so so my proposal here would be that uh, we uh, I think we have a spec organizing problem here, where um, I don't think I, I I think it would be easier for implementers is if WebRTC PC uh, listed all the reasons. For when and when a track when a track should be muted or unmuted, uh, and I think that's our first order of business is to separate. And we did this for constraints, for example. The media capture main has a similar job of defining what constraints are, but then also enumerating specific constraints for microphone and camera uh, and things like width and height. And in the past, we've decided that um, if other specs want to expose constraints, they need to specify them. Uh, explicitly, which we did for screen capture, which, um, you know, it makes sense in screen capture, and it might make sense for individual constraints, for example, width and height um, could be useful in certain aspects, but not others. So in order to, uh, and all this is JavaScript observable, so I think being as clear as possible in the, in the spec that defines the source is, is uh, important just to avoid ambiguity in language. Any objection to, to, to that approach? Yes. I, what, what I think like? there's, so I think there's, uh, I think we should separate the question of uh, where should, should the list of, of reasons for muting and unmuting uh, reside, which is what I think Johnny wants to, to mention from the sep separate question of, do we have an all encompassing list? Because uh, I would agree with Harald that if the peer connection disconnects, then yeah, I mean, we should we should mute if we don't already do that. 
but I would say that the, it's a mistake if that's not already listed in WebRTC PC. So it's it, that's not an argument for where we should define this list in which spec. So my reading is if, if a spec invents a new type of source, then it's up to that spec to define when that source mutes or unmutes. Unless yep. there's something that always applies, but I'm not sure there is. I think that makes sense. Um, Yuan? Yeah, uh, I would echo what uh, Henrik is saying. Uh, the source is defined by peer connection. So when mute happen and so on should be defined in, in PC. And we should be very clear about that and very clear that, uh, for instance, uh, Canvas Capture, for instance, should define its own muting. And by default, there's no muting uh, if it's not defining something like that. So Media Capture Main is specifying the concept, is defining when camera and microphones tracks are muting. And by default, no mute happen, except if the other texts that are defining the sources are defining reasons for being muted. And um, in terms of uh, the precise web CPT source thing, I, I think that we we could try to put that with the PR uh, properly so that it's open in WebRTCPC and mentioning some things with uh, an open-ended uh, list initially in WebRTCPC so that at least it's clear in Media Capture Main, like the model between Media, Ch Media Capture Main and the other specs is very clear. And then we can try as a follow-up to uh, more precisely uh, list the reasons for mute in WebRTCPC so that uh, Progressively, we will have Chrome, uh, Firefox, and Safari uh, converging when uh, remote tracks are muting. That sounds reasonable to me. Um, and it seems to me that we should also, since WebRTC PC is in REC, we should focus on a functionality that is already implemented and shipped. And we could still be open to uh, adding new functionality. We should probably add that to WebRTC extensions. Uh, do we have a path forward here, or are there other paths? So I think we have consensus that uh, that uh, for any case where we agree that browsers should mute on a specific action, like the buy, that should be in the spec. I don't think we have consensus that uh, it's a violation of the spec to mute at other times. The, well, I think uh, part of the issue there is that the way these algorithms are written, they don't really afford implementations to mute at other times without being careful about accidentally. Uh, if there are two sources, if there are two sources of mute events, then it's easy for one to step on the other because currently they each will maintain separate state and they will fire events based on those two states which can get out of sync. That's so it's in, <laughs> Well, it's also a spec language uh, problem uh, in that, for instance, the media capture main language about when to mute and unmute doesn't, you can't just be ORed in with the WebRTC PC definition without some thought of overlap. Uh, you win? Yeah, so, so it seems we agree that Media Capture Main should be really clear about uh, the organization. And then uh, the first question is whether um, we want all the specs that define sources to be open-ended in how they mute. And uh, hopefully we can say that uh, maybe WebRTPC could remain open-ended, but other specs would by default not be open-ended and they, we would need to change the other specs so that they are not open-ended to, to mute. For instance, uh, hopefully nobody is implementing mute for Canvas Capture. And if it would be good that we have spec language that says so, um, that we have an agreement that it's the case. Maybe uh, there, that it's reasonable for some Canvas Capture stream to be muted, in which case we will define it. But uh, hopefully for this particular case of Canvas Capture, uh, the list could be not open-ended, and that would be uh, that would be nice. And for whether it's CBC, the next question is whether it remains open-ended or not. Uh, we could do that 
we could follow up that discussion. I, I don't think we are ready yet to to converge. Right, and, and just one more data point I forgot is that I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that a major part of why muting and media capture main particularly was open-ended had to do with privacy and that it, because the sources were so, so sensitive being a microphone and camera that we wanted to give a lot of leeway to user agents to implement uh, privacy and uh, privacy controls on those sources in particular and those may not apply in all respects so i think it's i like this model of separating things so that hopefully most specs do not need open-ended uh user agent allowances for mute so we can get interrupt and, and just to to mention uh it would be great if we if we could list in uh in the github issue on web um when chrome is for instance muting because i guess chrome is muting in in various cases and it would be really nice if you if we get if we can get that list because maybe then safari and firefox would align uh, now without this information it's a bit difficult to to know what, what is being done and and how we can get into there. All right, any other comments? If not, then thank you very much. Hey, thank you. All right, we're gonna go back to this tab. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna talk about an issue in WebRTC SVC, but before we get to that issue, uh, we need to talk about a general background of media capabilities and in particular the privacy review that was done there and what what media uh, working group is going to do so a little bit of uh background info so i uh, hope most of you already know what media capabilities is but basically uh what it's doing is it supports uh providing uh, media information for a variety of use cases and the use cases are actually quite different so it supports file media source, media recorder, and WebRTC all in one API. And the goal is to indicate whether an encoder or decoder config is supported, power efficient, or smooth. Um, one thing to understand is it, ha it has no hardware check. So you can you can call media capabilities and, and get this info at any time. OK, for decoding, the intent is to replace the is type supported or can play type APIs. Um, which indicate if something can, can't be decoded, but not how well it should perform. Um, and then for scalable video cutting, which is what we wanted to talk about here, it provides info on encoders, which is the supported scalability modes, as well as some info on decoders, which is whether the decoders uh, provide support for spatial scalability. Okay, so that's what media capabilities is, like a little bit of background. I think the important thing to realize, to focus on here is it's trying to, to support a variety of use cases. And that complicates the privacy analysis. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, Ping did a review of media capabilities in March, 2021. They did like the fingerprinting analysis that was done. They said that was, that was good. Uh, but then they asked about the negotiation model. Um, and they said, why are we exposing device capabilities to the app for purposes of negotiation? Couldn't we instead have sites expose available media formats and have browsers pick the one they like best? Okay. Um, now, uh, the problem with this comment is that it reflects a mindset uh, more uh, in the streaming world where you have a website, you know, go to the site, it has particular media like it's streaming HLS or something, um, and there's available media formats in the catalog and the browser chooses the one that it wants to do but doesn't really reflect the WebRTC usage of um, this particular API. So basically what we're seeing here is the fact that media capabilities tries, I mean, the good news is it handles a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, the bad news is that stuff has different models um, and that's uh, uh, a, a little bit of a problem for the, for the privacy analysis. Um, so the way that Media Working Group is gonna go try to address this is I'm gonna, um, we're gonna, try to add the different use cases to the privacy analysis. And uh, I'm doing a PR to explain RTC, which doesn't really fit into the model that Ping has, uh, which is more streaming. And then we're gonna do separate PRs potentially for some of the other use cases, uh, like streaming, which are different, okay? Um, so 
the main point here is this ping review has been open since almost three years <laughs> um, without being fully addressed. And ping is kind of getting anxious and uh, uh, they, they really want um, this stuff to be cleaned up. So um, this is so far where I've gotten on the RTC's capabilities model. Um, this is a PR which will be reviewed in media working group, but I just wanted to put it out there, kind of what I'm, uh, this PR is, you know, as I've said, other people will get add stuff to it relating to the other use cases. But um, what I'm trying to get across is why it is that websites just don't choose all the media for where you see, which is kind of the mental model that, that Ping has of it. Um, and the basic issue here is that uh, in Weber to see the media flows between peers. It doesn't flow through the website. Although the website could play a role in signaling, um, it doesn't get involved in the media path. Um, and I guess there's two other things to mention is that, you know, we have Weber to see sports one-to-one -one calls where the peers directly negotiate the media between each other. But then in the conferencing model, um, it really can't work that way because you'd have, you know, N squared negotiations. And so you negotiate with the conference server or the, or the bridge or whatever it is um, and, uh, and do your negotiation there. So uh, what I'm asking here is, I don't wanna talk about this too much in this meeting, but I would uh, like to solicit reviews of PR212. Um, so if you, uh, you know, uh, after the meeting, you can click on it and uh, put your comments in and review it. Um, and uh, um, we can we can try to get a good uh, description in there of why uh, the uh, ping concept doesn't really work for for what we're seeing. Okay, so that's the background on what's been going on, which is basically ping uh, has been reviewing media capabilities. They don't understand uh, mentally; they're applying the streaming model to it. Um, and uh, don't understand why Weber to see works differently. So you, it's kind of weird. You have this one API handles a bunch of stuff and the privacy is different between all the things it handles. Okay. So this one, issue 92 is about, uh, is in Weber to see SBC. Um, and so Ping, after having done their review of media capabilities, did a review of Weber to see SBC. Um, and they applied their mental model of how they thought media capabilities worked and how they thought Weber C work to Weber C SVC. And here's what they said. They said uh, it would expose additional fingerprinting surface and needs to have some protection for that. Um, and he's suggesting the hardware check being discussed in other specs would be a place to work to solve the privacy risk. Um, that is a little strange because as I mentioned, media capabilities does not have a hardware check, uh, but I guess he's referring to a hardware check that Henrik had proposed in for something else. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Nivar? Yeah, I believe they're, they're referring to the the check we have in Media Capture Main on Get User Media. I think that's... Uh, Is that the one? So that, okay. I think so, yeah. Okay. Which would be which would be a solution to this, perhaps, but it's a bit unfortunate since uh, we also have ICE, uh, the way ICE right. behaves and other things. Um, depend on it and it's a bit of a permission escalation uh, frankly yeah so one of the reasons why media capabilities doesn't have a hardware check is because it's trying to do so much stuff right they didn't want to impose a hardware check on something like streaming when you go to watch your youtube movie or whatever it is now you get a question about camera escalation and that just seems spooky right in fact it actually is kind of evil if you had to enable a camera for someone to watch a YouTube video. Like, why is YouTube watching me? Makes no sense. Um, so uh, anyway, so they're talking about the hardware check. And, and as I mentioned, um, uh, it's not enabled in media capabilities because of all the different models. But let's talk about what the what is actually going on in Weber to see SVC, what you can actually do. Um, so through trial and error, you can use set parameters to determine what scalability modes are supported for each codec, right? You just set a codec and a scalability mode, you try to set it, and if it fails, uh, it, doesn't mean, it, it means it's not supported. However, um, that doesn't tell you whether it's supported in hardware or software. I believe you can't determine that until the media starts to flow, and then maybe you could look at the performance from stats and try to figure it out. 
Um, but the other thing is that set parameters only applies to the sender and not the receiver. So as I mentioned, media capabilities also tells you other things such as the support for spatial scalability. Um, you cannot determine that from set parameters because it doesn't work on the receiver. Um, and even if you send, like if you did loopback or something and started sending something to your uh, receiver and try to figure out whether it supports something, um, you would have to, you know, that could be hidden by software failover. Um, so for example, if you had a hardware decoder that for some reason didn't support spatial scalability, then um, you wouldn't see, that wouldn't get decoded. But I guess if it failed over the software, it would. Florent? You would also only test the local client, not the remote client. So in the purpose of peer-to-peer -peer communication, that wouldn't work. Right, right, right. So uh, the bottom line is that in Weber CSVC, you get a subset of the info that's in media capabilities, which doesn't have a hardware check. Um, and also there are things in Weber GSVC where you might want to receive only, like we've been talking about gaming or streaming and stuff like that. Um, and you don't want to impose a hardware check and require a camera permission to watch a video. Um, so that's kind of where we are on, on the uh, scalability, uh, uh, on, on scalability mode privacy. And so what I've done here is to try to rewrite the privacy considerations to kind of address the ping uh, issues. And I think we'll probably, this will probably have to evolve along with the media capabilities uh, privacy analysis. Um, but uh, basically starting off by talking about what the media capabilities API provides um, and, and then uh, basically what is in WebRTC SVC, um, and uh, I don't know if anybody has a other comments on what ought to be what ought to be in there. Uh, I guess is that uh, Henrik? So I'm, I'm a bit confused because I, I get that uh, scalability mode is a subset kind of of, of media capa media capabilities. But did Ping give a thumbs up for media capabilities, or is it just that they haven't? Uh, raised these issues there yet but will well uh so going back they did raise a bunch of them they objected to the whole nature of webrtc so they basically said this whole stp stuff has got to go doesn't make any sense we don't like it websites should determine what media flows that's that was the ping review of media capabilities why do you even have stp this must you know it doesn't make sense to us um, so, th <laughs> so that was their analysis in March 2021, um, and the, you know, it's it's actually kind of excusable. Um, it isn't as ridiculous as it sounds because you've got this API that handles like four very different use cases, right? It does, it does media streams, it does WebRTC, it does files, it does media recorder, right? So, the models of all of these things are completely different. So they got very confused um, and they don't, you know, um, and, uh, you know, so, so that's basically what happened, uh, Henrik. And so they, uh, what's interesting is they did not ask for a hardware check in media capabilities and media capabilities is not going to have a hardware check. Um, they declined to, uh, to do that. Um, because I mean, I think the two issues are, are related. Like, if media capabilities can expose this, right. then there's no point in doing anything in in WebRTC. Um, right. Whereas, right. if this is a problem, well, then you should probably prompt when you do uh, MC uh, media capabilities. Well, they in don't. Which case yeah. You could piggyback on it later, but. Uh, but they don't want to do that because then your streaming video would basically have a prompt. Right. Well, well, but then uh, we should be consistent, right? Like uh, if it's well, okay for MC, then it's okay for Weber C, right? Yeah, that's what you'd think if you were using your logical mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I'm trying to point to um, um, media capabilities uh, to say like, if if it's allowed to be exposed in media capabilities, then we can ex uh, expose it. 
as well. Um, right, right. And then because we need to solve it in the same place, I think. Right, like, and right now we we are some we have some places where we check is the camera open, which obviously that makes no sense at all. Right, but you right. could you could have a media capabilities check that says if either camera is open, go for it, or you prompt the user and not asking for camera, but asking for like, do you want to expose system information or something like that? Uh, I think that would still be weird because that gives prompts uh, right. in in cases where we don't. Yeah, have there's no today, so there's compat issues, but right. like we need to know if that's the path they want to go or if if well that uh, might be the path okay. he wants to go it's not the path that any of the streaming people want to go right uh, like yeah yeah the netflix people don't want to put up a prompt you know before you watch every movie yeah uh, Florent? um i think that we can discuss uh, those issues all we want but if we don't I don't see the points because we are mostly all aligned and uh, we need to get them to understand the uh, way that uh, real-time communication works on the internet and if it don't well, we can publish any pull request we want I don't think it will make them budge um, so how about we invite them to explain them um, our situation so they can react directly and um, have more direct feedback instead of waiting uh, years and years for more feedback and okay and so uh our all right. um, requests okay so uh so your proposal is invite them here and try to explain to them why sdp shouldn't be removed from webrc Maybe <laughs> explain them how it works. That it's bigger than the browser. That is also okay. like a system of other devices that you need to in, um, have interoperability with. So okay, yeah. that, right. that could be a way to move forward. I think it could be. Uh, could also result in blocking of all of the specs in the working group. But uh, we can deal with that uh, if they want to escalate. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see how to make progress otherwise, really. Okay. Um, so don't be that's, my, that's my take. So don't be unreasonable, even if you're paying. <laughs> okay. It's a new principle. All right. Uh, so we will we will try to try to do that. Uh, and uh, okay. So one more comment. Yeah. One of you. Uh, yeah. So I, I think what uh, Ping is missing here is that uh, when you say FTP, what's unique in WebRTC is that the signaling with the other endpoint, the server or the other endpoint, uh, is in JavaScript, right? So that's there's no way to not expose that to JavaScript. Uh, and so I think one of the things that might they might be asking for here is that well what if you don't get media capabilities are you still constrained from making a call and you could say that they're asking for it well just do a substandard call then if you don't have camera or microphone so i think that's that's the alternative we're looking at right so the uh whether that's tenable or not uh if that's not tenable i think we should provide use cases where uh, a participant doesn't necessarily need to um, uh, have camera microphone in order to participate in a web conference call, for example, or other use cases like that, where SVC is needed, but uh, camera and microphone is not. And we should be able to provide those, hopefully, uh, and, and providing a good explanation for why we need this. Yeah, I think the JavaScript point is a good one, right? Because the signaling is done through that. So if you didn't have... Uh, if we removed STP, like how would you signal to the other side? That that's kind of a good point. Yeah, um, yeah, it is complicated, Jan Ivar, by the fact that um, we have failover is kind of hidden. Yeah, Pippo. Oh, I wanted to point out that without STP negotiation, you can do G seven eleven audio. 
because the payload type is static. Ah, right. <laughs> Well, we could determine a minimum set of codecs that uh, you know, could be exposed. Uh, and if they're always the same ones that are exposed across browsers, it wouldn't provide much of a fingerprint. Well, but that's payload the, types are still negotiated. That's because the, they're not statically that's the MTI for you? Right. But no, uh, I, I don't think we should even uh, waste time discussing that kind of redesign. There's, there's all the reasons to do it, but uh, uh, let's let's not discuss it on this basis. Uh, our current WebRTC PC is what what it, what it is. Yeah, the other thing that was pointed out actually in the media capabilities privacy analysis is that uh, generally codecs tend to uh, come with new devices. New codecs tend to come with new devices, and then when they come, basically all the devices like you know if you get a a new iPhone or whatever, you get the codecs that are in that iPhone. Um, and so they, they tend to come in waves so that really all you're learning is whether it's something, if somebody has a newer device, you know, a newer iPhone or something like that, uh, it's not really the kind of thing that is a huge privacy risk. If, you know, a zillion iPhone 15 Pros get sold with AV1 decode, you know, in hardware, is that really, you know, do you really um, learn a lot? Uh, I, Go ahead, Yuan. Yeah, ju just to say that um, we, we do not have the same analysis there. Uh, we, think it, we think it's an important issue. And <laughs> sure, the new devices will be uh, 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 will increase over time. So maybe it's not an issue for them, but it's an issue for the, uh, for the other devices that do not have uh, the codec. And that, that, that they will diminish. And at some point, it will be very important uh, as a fingerprinting issue. And uh, oh, we, we try to oh, put, when, when we can, we try to put uh, fingerprinting uh, mitigations like uh, doing software, for instance, uh, if we can. Right. So. Yeah, so software is considered a privacy mitigation because it'll show that it has the support even if it's in, in hardware. Yeah, Florent? Yeah, there is also some um, fingerprinting issues related to uh, GPUs that are present on some platforms. I know that if you have some specific NVD cards, for example, you would have some extra H.264 decoders on Windows. Right, right, right. Across. Right. So <laughs> there is a little bit more exposed. There is still a broad class of device that doesn't tell you much more than web GPU capabilities would tell you, probably. Right. OK, well, thank you for those. I think those are additional things uh, worth putting into the privacy analysis. Um, and I will continue to continue to work on it. All right, thank you. Okay, so now we are, I think, talking about uh, this is media capture transfer, Harold. Yes. So um, uh, I looked at uh, outstanding issues there, and uh, which could be solved. I mean, Janiva and I had a long discussion about six months ago something like that, uh, about uh, what what happens when you mute, because uh, video track generator has a mute button, or mute attrib muted attribute. And uh, so the two possible models are that uh, if you set mute, you fire a mute every day. And, uh, or you can say that you set mute, and then queue a task, and sometime later the uh, the task comes back and it can check mute, check if mute has changed from what it was previously, and uh, and then then fire a, a muted event on the output tracks. So after reviewing the discussion, I found that now I agree with Janiva. It's simpler to, for the user to reason about the about the the one that fi fires uh, the less le less number of events. So I thought, since I, since most people most have forgotten about this one, probably I thought I'd bring it up here and say, "Are we okay with that? If so, let's go. Let's close the issue." Janiva and Guido give thumbs up. And you end.
and me. <laughs> so that that was quick. We have consensus. But now we're on Tony. Yes, so this is from the encoded transform spec. Um, I was looking into the video frame metadata. And while we have um, a few of the fields defined in the IDL, we don't have uh, like textual definitions for a lot of them. So starting out with the frame ID and dependencies, uh, as described here, we have a this unsigned long, long frame ID, but no actual description of what it is. Um, the way it's implemented in Chromium is that it's using the same counter as we use for the dependency descriptor header extension. And on the receive side, uses the field, the frame ID that we get in the dependency descriptor, unwrap that to up to 64, by, uh, 64 bits, and then expose that as the frame ID. And then dependencies are just a list of frame IDs. So my proposal that um, we discussed a little on the issue is to keep the, the type as it is, add a definition that is essentially the same as uh, what's defined in the dependency descriptor, um, a monotonic counter, which um, yeah, increases in decoding with frames. Um, ideally, sort of have this reference to the dependency descriptor to say that it will match the, the lower 16 bits, which is all that's included in the header extension. And also, um, in some discussions with uh, FIPRO, we came to the idea that it probably makes sense to say on the receiver, we only set these fields if the dependency descriptor header extension is sent to avoid sort of codex specific complexities. So, thoughts? Bernard, I think. Yeah, uh, I just had a comment, I think, um, on the definition of dependency. Um, it, in the dependency descriptor, dependencies are the frame IDs that the frame references. It is not all of the dependencies, because unless a dependency is a keyframe, right, it has its own dependencies. So in, in DD, there's dependencies, and then there's chains. Chains are basically get you all the way back to the to the kind of keyframe um, and basically tell you uh, everything that dependencies you know recursively back to to the keyframe that originated so what we call dependencies here is just the DD dependencies right it's not the chains uh, so yeah. anyway I think the definition should just use it's just the frame IDs that are that are referenced directly referenced so to make that clear. Um, my question was also, was there any interest in ever supporting chains? Or is that, uh, I mean, in theory, I believe you can derive the chains from the dependencies, like you'd have to recursively go back and do it. It's obviously, uh, you know, not a simple thing to do. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm just wondering if that would ever come in or it's just frame ID and dependencies. Yeah, is there anything extra you can do with having the chain so that if you don't have one of the dependencies, you can still see the full? Well, so the thing is that uh, if you just send the dependencies, what um, the the problem is, the, the reason why the, the chains are in the dependency descriptor is that this is the way to think about this. This is really info that is used by the conferencing server, right, to decide whether to forward something. So. Um, you know, it'll look at the dependencies to say, oh, if I didn't send one of the dependencies, it doesn't make sense to forward this thing because it's obviously non-decodable, right? But it's it's also possible that I did file, I did forward the dependencies, but it's still non-decodable because like one of the dependencies was a P frame and, and the guy never got the key frame for that thing, if that makes any sense. So that's why, that's why there's also chains there because there can be these circumstances where the dependencies are fulfilled for a participant, but um, it's still not decodable because one of the dependencies of the dependencies didn't get fulfilled, if that makes sense. Does that make any sense? Are you not making the same decision when you forwarded that dependency and sort of saw that that was not decodable? Or is this is where you later on get more information 
and then realize that frame you earlier sent could not actually be decoded? Uh, well, so there's a bunch of things going on here. Uh, you know, the SFU gets uh, information on whether something was knacked, right? But it's it's um, doesn't necessarily uh, uh, except through the LNTF RTCP feedback extension doesn't know whether a frame was decodable. Um, so, uh, but but for the purpose of DD, DD only reflects what was sent. It's a little bit complicated. So it's it's there. It's remember all of this info is created on the encoder. Right. It's so the the encoder doesn't know what Tony got, like it only knows what it what it encoded, right? And and the dependency of the stuff it's encoding, whether you got it or not, it has no knowledge. It's not the conference server, you know. It has no clue. Um, so it's just providing this stuff to the SFU, who hopefully does have that information. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah. So I, just to be clear, uh, I think what you're proposing makes sense to keep the unsigned long long and i think the uh definition of frame id makes sense and a modified version of the dependencies makes sense so everything you've got here i you know i'm on board with my only question and you don't have to answer it now is whether it also makes sense to have chains and, and we can figure that out in some other issue thanks sounds good uh i know there's some uh, discussion over the whether the user agent should be the one doing the unwrapping from 16 bits up to 64 bits. I think there was precedent somewhere else. I don't remember which field that was, but uh, yeah, definitely the, view. It's the, a lot the, easier if it takes care of it. Sorry, extend, the, extend the sequence number in RTP. That does the same kind of extension. And then it uh, it has an especially RTCP message for sending the, for, for saying what they think they are the upper, upper bits are once in a while. Uh, so for the summary, uh, Henrik, I think uh, we we seem to have consensus to go forward as Tony has proposed. Any objections? OK, cool. Awesome. Thanks. All right, so uh, this is mark resizing mode, sample rate, and sample size. And I will click on the issue, and hopefully it comes up. OK, Yaniver. Yes, thank you. This is, uh, I hope, more of a formality is that uh, some things in media capture main, a couple of constraints, uh, only have uh, one implementation. So the proposal is to mark them as feature at risk. They are read size mode, which controls uh, how uh, the browser will, whether it will and if you provide width and height, whether it will downscale to the exact dimensions or whether it will find the closest thing supported by the driver. And there's also sample rates and sample size for audio and uh, latency, uh, which are more common to um, to use with get settings, I think, than trying to constrain. Any objection to marking these as feature at risk? So, and speaking for Firefox, I think we're okay with uh, marking these. Uh, Guido? Uh, I would oppose marking them as uh, features at risk because uh, resize mode is, is widely used uh, by people who use Chrome to make sure that, that uh, 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 for example, to disable uh, rescaling, which is the default uh, action historically in Chrome and, and to choose how, how, how they want to resize. And so some, some users have even requested even an additional resize mode that preserves uh, aspect ratio. Uh, with regards to, well, the other three, uh, Chrome implements them to varying degrees. Latency is used. Uh, particularly on, on Windows, which is where, where it's best implemented for users to to select uh, capturing with the lowest possible uh, buffer sizes. Uh, so, so it, it is actively used. So, so, I mean, if we if we eventually remove them from the spec, we would not be able to to not 
uh, to not uh, to remove them from the web because it would break the web. Uh, sample size and sample rate. Uh, yeah, uh, Chrome exposes them and imp implements them, but I'm not aware of of, of uh, any uh, use case uh, for sample rate. Uh, maybe the, 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 there is more uh, for sample size. I, I, I've never heard of of, uh, of anyone having a, a, a use case. So maybe sample rate be good, but 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 it's exposed. Uh, and normally, when we expose some, uh, remove something that is exposed, someone someone complains. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I, I'm just a quick on regarding sample rate. Isn't this? I think there was a, an issue a while back where people were SDP managing to decide the sample rate of the audio codec. And I think one of the decisions there, if I'm not completely misremembering, is, oh, why are you modifying this in SDP? Why don't you just do what the track does? In which case, maybe we need that. But I'm not sure. That's the only comment. So, all right. so Yonivar, I was thinking that maybe, like in the past, what we did was putting some migrating some features from one spec to the extension specs for the features that were uh, not uh, mature enough in terms of implementation. So maybe all these four could be moved to the media capture extensions and instead of marked feature address, or may maybe both, uh, I don't know, something like that. But I, I guess that uh, even though we remove them from media capture main, uh, it might still be good to keep them in somewhere. So to to have a description. Okay, uh, is that a, an approach that would be people would be amenable to? You know, uh, I think uh, that could work for latency, sample rate, and sample size. For resize mode, I would be more resistant because it's 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 very integrated with the constraints processing mm. algorithm. Uh, but okay. uh, yeah, the other three, I mean, right. move them to, to extensions and still expect that uh, to uh, specify them. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be particularly opposed to that. All right, great. Uh, so, Gator, just uh, clarifying on resize mode, uh, the Chromium default there is already to automatically downscale, right? Uh, yes. Platform. Yeah. To downscale, if I mean, if if if, if the if the best is the resolution that best matches constraints is not the native one, then uh, downscale to that. So uh, Firefox, we do plan to align with the Chrome here, so we would also automatically downscale, which uh, and part of the original reason, our original reason for resize mode was that the Firefox default right now is not crop and scale, but none. So, but since we're going to change to the Chromium way of doing things, then I'm curious what the use case, what, what is the remaining use case for developers uh, turning resize mode off, basically? Uh, oh, so some, some, some people want to use a native, want to make sure they use a native capture uh, format. So. OK. And you, you're, you're seeing users that then they use of that feature. All right. You do, do you know? These people, because maybe uh, if they reach out to uh, Mozilla and to to WebKit community, then they, they, we we might get a higher incentive to actually implement resize mode as well. I, I don't know off the top of my head who they are, but I mean the, 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 it has been uh, it's people that have we have interacted with in bug reports and so on. So it's not not. No, okay. No, if I, you, I have a, a permanent relation, but uh, yeah, I, I can try to look it up and. Yeah, or if you have web pages, send them to us, and then um, because usually when we have a, a web web compat issue, uh, we, we we put them higher priority. So maybe resize mode could be a uh, move to higher priority, uh, or at, we could at least look at implementing it. That would be great. Yeah, I think that works for us as well. So I think the resolution is to move sample rate, sample size, and latency to the extension spec. Is that right? That, uh, yeah, that would work. All right, great. So then it's, at least we have a spec for it. Yeah. And uh, work yeah. work harder on this side mode. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, now we have uh, two issues on MST content hit. Harold. Yep, so um, for those who love scripts, the first point we found, uh, we, we have uh, some text saying that when you use MST content hint uh, in text, you activate some uh, some uh, flags in uh, in uh, in AV1 to say that uh, okay, take a little more trouble in uh, managing the resolution of these fonts. And uh, the original PR was that. Uh, was intended to acknowledge that in some scripts, I put I pulled up a couple of examples here. Details matter more than in others, so that you can imagine that if you downscale those fonts, they would be become unreadable a bit before uh, ASCII would become unreadable. And so Bernard suggested that we also have a note that uh, if we have color text, for instance, red and yellow. And encode in four four two zero. That will result in a lower resolution than uh, than uh, than what uh, we would get with black and white. And so he was uh, suggesting that we might want to do something, say something about using four 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 in those situations. Now, using four 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 is. Uh, which means that you have the same resolution for all colors. It's profile specific, and it uses a lot more bandwidth. So uh, we may not want to mandate it here, but uh, I kind of got uh, uh, so three three different ways out here. One was that we would reword the addition to note that in color of color. Encoding of color text made cost readability issues, and because of four to zero, but don't say anything about recommend, recommending or mandating something. Second level, recommend use of four for four if color text dominates the, the slide or whatever. I mean, there's no point in using four for four if it's black and white, or if it's uh, if the text is huge anyway. Or we could say that uh, we mandate use of 444 with AV1, just as we uh, mandate text encoding tools. So, searching for opinions is one clearly better than the other. You win? Yeah, I, I wouldn't go with uh, mandating. Um, it, it's it's a content hint, uh, so I'm all fine with uh, saying like, "Hey, uh, user agents, please be advised that there's this and this." So if it's a V1, maybe you should think of uh, using 444. And in that in those context, uh, I think it's it's helping implementations to to give advices, but in terms of monitoring and and so on, I'm not sure. It's uh, we'll have wording that is always right, so it, it would be too far for me. Yeah, so three is out. Yeah, Bernard. Yeah, three is also out for me. Uh, in AV one, I believe four 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 is high profile, and uh, that you know, as you said, it's a lot of bandwidth, and uh, I'm not even sure is it even in supported in any browser right now. High. I don't know, Guido, do you remember? Uh, anyway, it's it's certainly not uh, prevalent. So, uh, yeah, I, I might keep it, to, unless it's been implemented somewhere, you know, it definitely shouldn't be a mandate. And, uh, oh, Flora said, remember seeing changes to support more from us a while ago. Yeah, so we can check, but it's certainly not prevalent everywhere. Uh, so mandate seems too much. Uh, maybe maybe one or or uh, you know two. Uh, well, it, it depends. I wouldn't 
I wouldn't necessarily even recommend, you know, recommend seems even pretty high for something like this. Like it's, it's almost like saying that somebody who implements AV1 must support 444. I don't know if we're ready even for that. Hmm. So it uh, tends it towards one, but let's hear from Jan Ivar. So, um, yeah, I also would uh, move toward uh, the smaller number suggestions, I think. Uh, my concern is a little more uh, sideways, maybe, in that uh, the media capture content hint spec is the house, uh, it defines both a hint on the track, but also an equivalent API uh, that is not hint based. For instance, uh, the music hint affects the uh, echo cancellation, auto gain control, and noise suppression constraints. And the for video, it it affects. We define the degradation preference on the send parameter. So there's always uh, a source based or a sync based surface API as well. So I guess that I'm reluctant to add new functionality that is specific only to the actual hint on the track. Uh, you know that would ask make me wonder if that should be a corresponding API on the sync for that as well. So I think that would lean toward uh, that would leave out suggestion three for sure, and maybe two as well. Yeah. Although recommending is always yeah. <laughs> always recommend things. Yeah. yeah, it's better to recommend things that you can actually do, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Philip? Uh, we do have 444 support in H.264. And what we might do is prefer that codec if content hint is set. But I wouldn't recommend it too much. People can do codec negotiation all the way they want. So I'd go for a suggestion one. Yeah. OK, I hear a consensus on su suggestion one. So I'll take that back and write the, uh, and rewrite the PR. Thank you. Next. Oh, that's me too. So the APA has reviewed content hits. And uh, that's not uncommon. They have uh, made uh, reviewed it from a viewpoint of, uh, well, the world, ex world exists on, in files and uh, sets of files and files that are, are dependent on each other and linked to each other. And the market see doesn't work like that. So uh, I tried to pick up the various issues they raised. I mean, they have some spelling mistakes, obviously, fix them. But they have use cases with support files, captions or audio descriptions for video. And I think that's that's for mock, not uh, not for, not for WebRTC. We don't do uh, links between uh, things at our level. So that's, uh, so I suggest saying that, no, we, in a track model, a track is a track is a track. And uh, things that link tracks together have to, have to be specified at a higher level. It's not for this spec to do. They also had a couple of suggestions for giving different parts of the video different treatment. <coughs> motion with transcription, for instance, that we, you, you would do embedded subtitles and uh, apply, apply the motion hint for most of the video and then find the subtitles somehow and apply text treatment to those. But uh, I kind of folded that into the next uh, point on the list, which was treatment by region so that you get a different treatments by different parts of the video. And I kind of want to say that, no, this is, this, this depends on a, a model for 
defining regions on uh, on videos, which we don't have. Well, we actually have almost that in the face detection extensions that have been proposed. But uh, it's not something I want to depend on at this moment. But we can hold that idea. And they also ask about transporting hints. Well, we don't. The, the hints influence the local encoder and then that's the end. So that's, uh, that's how I suggest that we address this review, mostly saying not our problem and saying, and this is a, an extension that we, that we don't have a way to support at the moment. And no, this is not how it works. Does that seem reasonable to you? Bernard is first on the queue. Yeah, I am. Um... I think we, uh, I, I agree with your general approach because it actually makes sense, but um, leaving the, uh, but having said that, uh, I think we're getting into a very weird world where because of things like mock, right? In mock, many of these things are possible. Although, well, in, they're theoretically possible in that they mock can transport them if you can actually generate them. Um, but the, the big question is how would you actually generate them in real time? Um, and uh, I would mention also that there are European accessibility regulations which are coming in, which are going to be interesting to support and potentially may need some of this stuff. Um, so I agree entirely that this is not a problem for the MST content hint spec, but uh, there probably ought to be some way to discuss this more generally with the media working group, because the media working group is talking about things like text chat, um, and captioning and stuff like this. Um, and I, I don't know that any of it is applicable to WebRTC. Uh, but I, just, it, it, uh, yeah. I just pressed this, the CC button on my on my screen and to demonstrate uh, having a text track alongside the video right. track. So yes, they exist, but that's a higher level of application. Right, right, right. Uh, and uh, I mean, people have tried to make standards for that. And I think my, Mimi is going to try that too. Right, right. Um, so there's stuff going on here. It doesn't apply to content hints. Uh, with respect to the region stuff you talked about, the big issue there, right, is it, it often will require things like per media block QP, which is not something we support in not only in WebRTC, but even in Web Codex. You know, we have right. per frame QP, but not per micro block QP. Yeah, um, I, th uh, I think it would uh, require require the definition of uh, of a region region metadata saying this part of the of the frame is this is this kind of thing. This part of the right, frame. Right. Right. Well, we kind of have that with the face stuff, but um, anyway, well, uh, so I think I think you're on the right track with respect to the APA review of this spec, um, but I'm wondering if there's some larger meeting we should have um, related with APA and maybe the media working group together at some point, maybe a TPAC, because um, I'm I'm just worried about the same thing happening with APA that's happened to Ping, where they kind of get ignored for years and then they kind of go viral, and yeah, go insane. And so, and, uh, so I think that would make an excellent uh, Wednesday TPEC session. Oh, actually, that's a good a good point. Yeah. So just get the get the right people, get people from the right groups into the into the meeting and uh, and see if we can spend an hour of uh, of getting uh, getting clear about what uh, what we want and how it matches with what is possible. Right. Yeah, actually, that sounds good. We could put that down in the minutes uh, as something to work on. That would be great. Yeah, that sounds good. So I'll uh, draft, a, draft a reply. I don't see anything that uh, actually needs to change in the spec. But uh, I'll, I'll try to be polite. That's usually useful. Okay. 
Okay, we're six minutes over time. Not more. That's amazing. Nice. All right, so that's uh, my slide. So um, we've been talking with uh, various people uh, working on uh, Google Meet, and they raised the point that um, our APIs are not covering. And so I would like to propose an API um, to address that. So the goal um, is that they want to be able to optimize the trade-offs uh, in the application uh, between device resource usage and the compression efficiency. We want to be able to say, it's okay if uh, you don't spend as much CPU time uh, and you compress less. It's okay. I want the performance of the device to be better, um, even if it doesn't compress as much. Um, so uh, we are thinking of uh, suggesting an API uh, to cover that uh, use case. And uh, we looked at other existing applications and uh, applications and APIs. And most of them seem to have uh, some similar setting that allows you to say, I want to be able to compress, uh, to try really hard to compress the video or not spend as much time. Uh, we have Android Media, uh, which is uh, the framework used on Android devices to compress video, has an integer that is from zero to nine. There's some other uh, APIs, Azure Media Service, which I believe is deprecated, but that's still a relevant example, I believe, which has three settings, spin, balance, and quality. X264, which is uh, an H264 encoding library, which has many presets that are that go from ultra fast to very slow, and everything in between. Um, so th there's a lot of precedent in doing something like that, and that's something that seems to be not so controversial for um, encoding the framework. And I think it would be valuable for an application to be to able to decide if they want to prioritize battery life or if they want to prioritize maybe um, the compression so um, we would like to have an api that has a, a few different settings so next slide has um, an example of the api and settings would be um, compression comp uh, encoding complexity low normal and high and um, we could expect to have um, some different behavior depending on the codec, where uh, low could imply a lower uh, the resource usage age. Maybe a worse um, a stream that is uh, compressed not as well, but at the application to decide, or I where uh, we would try harder to uh, compress the data to, to get a better compression efficiency. Uh, we understand that it's still uh, trying to do uh, real-time communication. So you, you, you can't spend uh, two seconds per frame to encode it perfectly. Uh, but I think that um, tunings that uh, the browser can do in order to um, achieve what the application is asking for. Um, it would be um, optional to support all three different settings. Uh, maybe low and normal do the same thing and high uh, does something different. Uh, maybe it's the other way around for some uh, other, browser, uh, other codecs and browsers. But at least the application can express its intent to uh, be able to uh, save resources uh, whenever possible. Um, but was it for me? Uh, we have a question from Yuan. Um, yeah, we, so you were saying, hey, we, we can trade battery life versus compression efficiency. And uh, in, in the past, uh, I was taught that uh, sometimes comp comp compressing more is better for battery because you, you need to take into account the, the network cost uh, and so on. So my, my first question is, um, uh, how do native applications decide 
uh, their options. Uh, uh, what are the information they are using to, to make their, their decision good? And are, are web pages, do they already have this information as well, web pages, or is it uh, not available? And the second thing was, uh, have you considered maybe something like, uh, I'm a web page and I prefer battery life or I prefer quality, for instance? instead of uh, this, this complexity. And then it's up to the user agent to say, oh, you prefer battery, so maybe I will compress more because in that case, uh, it will preserve battery and so on. So th that, that was the uh, other possibility I was thinking in terms of uh, API shape. Right, so um, I think there's many different dimensions of resources that can be considered. One of them is indeed uh, battery life. Uh, another one could be uh, CPU time spent on it, which, which relates to battery life. But sometimes it's more, let's not hog the CPU down um, to uh, compress. This is um, low importance stream. So the faster you can send it, we know you have enough bandwidth. So don't try too hard to encode it. And I think it's important to have uh, per stream uh, setting because you might not be very important for your face while you're presenting something to be streamed really well, but your presentation is actually important. So we can say, hey, uh, don't spend too much time on the uh, on your face. The presentation, yes. Uh, so that's why um, a global setting per page uh, wouldn't probably work. Um, was I forget? Am I forgetting any part of your question? Um, so, so the setting it was not page or not page. It was more like uh, the 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 web the web page telling uh, for this stream I, I prefer this and for this stream I prefer I I don't know, but um, I, I'm really wondering how the web page will be able to compute uh, this value in a in a meaningful way. That's the main question, I guess. I think it's more about um, intent and knowing how those different uh, streams, what those different streams are are used for. Uh, as I said, well, thumbnails, um, it's not that important to encode them well. Presentations are more important. So by uh, virtue of where they're used in the application and maybe what um, content hints are available and all that, it could be better. It's also possible for an application to observe encode times uh, using stats. And um, if uh, an application thinks that an encode, average encode time for a stream is uh, too high in some circumstances for some content that is lower priority, it, it could decide to just make it um, a, a lower encode time setting for of this um, stream. So I, I think the application is still able to make decisions uh, using uh, those um, values where um, anchor time, QP are uh, some of the metrics that can be used at the moment. Um, we have uh, Yenivar. Uh, yeah, so, so you kind of answered one of my questions already, because I, I was going to say that aren't we going from a case of where this is controlled in the user agent, which has a lot of information about the system, to the web application, which has less information about the system. So moving it to the application could actually have a downside. But uh, you bring up a good case where there might be, uh, in, in order to differentiate, this stream is more important than the other stream. And I also see some similarity here with degradation preference, perhaps, in that there, there's uh, another variable we could tweak here on the encoder. So it might work. Uh, just early bike shed comments, I think complexity is sort of a negative. Uh, I kind of like the one you have here with speed balance quality instead of high, medium, high, low uh, feedback like that. Um, but again, I also have a concern, I guess, in how a web application would determine that it has device resources and ask for quality uh, across the board. Well, so. uh, using um, the stats uh, is a good way to know if you are able to uh, use different uh, settings. Um, there's uh, 
Yeah, uh, so as for the names, I'm not opposed to changing them. This is just, I had to propose something. So sure. yeah, this is also maybe could be related to a priority field that we have in some of the parts of the WebRTC APIs, where we have, um, we say this is more important, this is less important. Um, and then we make different decisions, usually in terms of uh, uh, bandwidth allocation. But in this case, this is more about CPU time alloc allocated for, uh, well, CPU or GPU or whatever resources is used to encode. Uh, don't spend as much time. It's not a very important. Or we're having bandwidth issues, but we know you have a, a, a very good CPU, so we'll try a little bit harder because this is an important call and you don't, wouldn't want to have a bad quality. So I, I think there is an opportunity here to allow applications to decide. They don't have to use it. But if they have ways to use it, they should be able to. And I don't think it's something that exposes uh, uh, much information um, that is uh, privacy sensitive. And also, it's uh, probably it's something that is very common in all other APIs. So I think we can have agree that in some situation, there is uh, a relevant uh, use for it. So what would medium or balanced mean? Uh, user agent decides, or it means in yes. the middle? Okay, yes. so maybe uh, unset. It's uh, what we currently have, basically. Uh, I said where um, the user agent makes its own decision. Um, the, the user agent could decide, oh, well, I, I'm spending too much time encoding frames, so I'm going to uh, encode with a lower complexity uh, the next frame. Uh, the agent uh, could be able to uh, do that kind of decision. But you could also have the application give sent to, to the user agent in order to uh, uh, have a better behavior. Right. So, okay, it might be better to have have the default be unset rather than unbalanced. But you know, I'll, there are other people in the queue. So. Yeah, well, we can discuss that uh, later. Um, uh, thank you for your feedback. Uh, Philip. Are you also looking to add this for audio? Because this concept maps really closely to what Opus had for complexity nodes, which is a setting between one and ten. I'm not opposed. If uh, you think that's something that is relevant, we could have it uh, also used for audio, although uh, it would be per browser and codec uh, dependent. So if uh, Browser implements implemented it for issue six four, but not uh, VP eight, VP nine, or but they did for AV one. There that wouldn't be an issue. It, it's more used as a hint for the browser. Yeah, I agree. Um, so yes, uh, in theory, there's nothing preventing us from having it in audio as well. Mm -hmm. I'll add notes to the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you went again. Yeah, I'm, I'm still a bit puzzled because the user agent is doing the uh, degradation thing and is doing the adaptation. So it, it seems good that the web page says, hey, for this track, uh, put more effort, for this track, put less effort, and so on. And then it's up to the user agent to do the fuel adaptation. Uh, that, that seems a, a good thing, but it, it's more like uh, where you set the priority between the streams. It's not really related to, to the QP or things like that. Though, uh, the user agent could derive from the priority to to these exact same values, but um, yeah, uh, I'm wondering whether that's sufficient, and uh, it might be easier to uh, to design there. Right. Um, yeah, you wouldn't be necessarily opt um, optimizing for um, for the QP with such an API, but that would be a consequence if you spend less time uh, encoding a frame you would end up with uh, something that has a different QP. So uh, the QP value that is higher, if I'm not mistaken yeah. in the order. Yeah, what, what I'm saying is that uh, the complexity mode, the name, it, it, to me, it's, it's more like uh, priority somehow. And yes. then, so it's not really related to, the name is somehow misleading. It's not really uh, uncode complexity mode. It's, uh, it's more, hey, User agent, please put priority there and not there. 
somehow. I, I think internally we had five different names for it and we can agree on one that was a le less bad that we could come up with. I'm totally open to uh, changing this to anything else um, with uh, similar semantics. This is more of a, a complexity hint, uh, uh, as we could say, and uh, if that's what you wanted to uh, rename it to, or anything else, I open for it. I just want this use case to be supported. Uh, the details don't really matter that much to me. Uh, I, I just want to because correct me if I'm wrong, but I, but I don't think this is just a priority between streams. It's it's that too, but it's also recognizing that even if you only have a single stream, you might have one use case where you care a lot about you know reducing bitrate, and and another use case where it's all about quality, right? Uh, absolutely, yes. It, it would also work for a single stream. Uh, we do have. Uh, Bernard on the queue. Yeah, um, just wanted to mention that Web Codex has the notion of real-time communications versus quality. Um, and the weird thing about that is that when you select quality, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, it takes a little bit longer, but it, it's not really clear that um, it's outside the real-time mode. So as an example, like I, I did a little test, you can move it to the quality and it, it doesn't, uh, it increases the latency a little bit, but not ridiculously. Um, so I, I guess my question is how how uh, this would relate to that. Like, do you have a, a maximum latency bound that you will never get to, even with the highest uh, level of complexity? How does it how does it work? This this is still WebRTC will still trying to do real time. Uh, this is just about spending a little bit more time. Um, on specific frames while still being uh, able to do real time uh, for whatever definition you have of real time but i mean it should be snappy it shouldn't be like encoding if you want with the first generations of encoders slow right but is does it have implications for things like playout delay or or jitter buffer uh like if you increase it to high you should have a higher jitter buffer it may have implication if you spend uh, too much time, but that's up to the um, uh, user agent to um, uh, make sure that the impact is minimal. If an application uh, asks for uh, spending more uh, resources to get a better compression efficiency, maybe that's a trade-off that uh, they're willing to, to have. So then the user agent should uh, probably uh, order through. But that, that's interesting feedback that we can have uh, when we specify uh, those values. And we could probably have some notes that there could be some more implications in uh, other aspects if you decide to, say, have um, higher complexity mode. Uh, Harold? Yeah, just don't call it priority. <laughs> we already yes, tried sure. that once. Yeah, it we, turned we, out we, that we have. Uh, we we had two different things that uh, we were trying to control with not one knob, so yeah. uh, make the knob uh, very focused on encode encoding. Right. Uh, so absolutely. If if it's encode priority, or if it's encode complexity mode, I don't care. But uh, don't try it. Uh, don't don't call it priority. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Because uh, as uh, Henrik uh, reminded us, if even if there's only a single stream. If there's no priority, it doesn't really matter because there's no competition with anything else. But we still want to lower the surface resource usages, even if it costs you a worse compression efficiency. Yeah. Or maybe spend more resources because this is something that is important to you, to your application. Uh, so a general question: Do we have a consensus that this is something we want to go ahead with, or what do people think? I think it's worth exploring, at least, okay. uh, iterating. All right. So I think you, okay. have, your, you have your feedback, Laura. Uh, I will come up with a pull request, and uh, we can iterate on it. And if you have more feedback, suggestions for names, or for all the enum values, or for the enum value itself, 
um, please uh, show up on the issue. Okay, uh, so we're at the end of the meeting. Um, we have a couple of action items, I think, uh, for the chairs, um, which you're kind of organizing a discussion with Ping, a discussion with APA, where there are other big kind of chair-like issues that we want to make sure we're in the minutes. So organize the discussion was the one I, I heard that was strictly a chair issue. Or, or uh, I mean, the the individual actions on each PR and uh, an right. issue are are in the hands of the people assigned to that those issues. Right. Okay. All right. So I think we have our action items going forward. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Ian. Okay. We'll see you online. Bye. See you soon. See you. Stop recording.